Are you struggling to find a job in tech, have all the requisite skills, but can't seem to get to that much coveted interview step? Well, here in today's video, we're going to be talking about how to craft the perfect tech resume, no matter if you're an experienced hire or if you're just straight coming out of college. I'm going to have this extensive guide over here along with a written version of the guide in order to show you guys the individual components of the resume, how to create them, and what you should and shouldn't include along with some tips and tricks to maybe help you move along the process. Hey guys, my name is Shashank Kalanithi. I'm a data analyst working out of Seattle, Washington, and this channel is all about helping you guys enter the world of analytics. But for today's purposes, the resume tips that we have will apply for anyone looking for a tech job. Before we get started, I do want to take a chance to uh, pitch my Patreon and my YouTube membership. They're both basically the exact same thing. And uh, for $5 a month, it's a very simple way to support the work that I do over here in addition to you know any likes or subscribes you might give and uh, has Discord benefits along with uh, you can directly contact me with any questions that you might have. So if you guys are interested, feel free to support the Patreon below. But if not, then please leave a like down in the uh, video below and uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. We're at 50,000 subscribers now. Let's see if we can get to 100,000 sometime soon. All right, so we're gonna be talking about crafting a winning tech resume. What do you need to do in order to make sure your resume gets you some winners in the interview category? So what is the purpose of a resume? Many people, especially tech people, like to think that it's the point, uh, the point of a resume is to show off all of your accomplishments and get you a job. And that's kind of correct, but really what it is, is it's supposed to do exactly one thing, get you an interview, that's it. That's the only thing your resume is supposed to do. In this video slash article, which I have on the screen and will be linked in the description below, I'm going to walk you through all the tips and tricks that I have that you'll need in order to craft a winning resume. So although I view this video as a as fairly all-encompassing, I'd love to hear what other experienced workers think. Um, so leave your critiques and comments in the comment section below. Uh, also, almost none of these tips are what I would call hard rules. If you have a good reason to break a rule, then feel free to do so and experiment as well. At the end of the day, the whole application process is kind of squishy in the sense that it, there is not a winning formula that'll, that'll work for all interviewers, for all um, recruiters at all times. And that's why you need to really think through the process and be like, okay, like Shashank said, do this thing. Does this make sense for my situation or not though? And if it does, go ahead and use my tips. If it doesn't, and you have a good reason to not go ahead and use that, then go do it your own way. All right, so first we're gonna be talking about getting into the mind of a recruiter. So one thing that I think a lot of people don't do is that they don't think about the application process from the point of view of the customer or client, which is the company trying to hire you. you a successful applicant always thinks about what do I need to do in order to make myself be the most attractive client, I mean, the attractive, most attractive candidate for the recruiter? What do I do to make myself the easiest yes for them? And that's really the angle we need to, you need to take for the entire application process. So remember, the recruiter has to look through dozens, if not hundreds of resumes to try and filter out whatever candidates that, that they wanna let pass through to the um, next stage. And a lot of recruiters do this for dozens of jobs simultaneously. It's why recruiting is an entirely, it's, it's a job by itself because you need to have people like dedicate their full time to just finding people filtering them through the process, making sure you get as few duds as possible and hiring them. So they will almost never read your resume. They only scan it. So this means that your goal is not to write a resume that reads like a book, but a pamphlet that someone can quickly scan to see if they should get you into the candidate screening process. So let's take a little bit of a step backwards and see what is the basic job application process for a lot of tech jobs. So the first thing you do is you apply. And then after you apply, the recruiter scans your resume. If they like it, then you will be offered a screening interview. This is basically where the recruiter will call you and they'll be like, hey, candidate XYZ, uh, I'm here to make sure you're not a sociopath and I need to make sure that like you cover the absolute basics. You might be asked a very um, softball technical question because a lot of companies want to eliminate candidates that just don't have the technical skills to apply for the job at this stage if they can. But usually this, pro this part is very easy. Just don't, don't say anything incredibly stupid and you will usually move on to the next section. Next, you will probably have a technical interview. Um, a lot of companies want to do this, the technical interview first, because if a candidate 
aces the behavioral part of the interview, but they don't have the basic technical skills, you can't hire them for a tech job. You know, that it's just not going to work out. So the technical interview will usually be the first thing that they give you because they want to eliminate as many candidates as they can in this step. Um, and I will put out a video later that talks about how to get through technical interviews, but that's not the purpose of this video. Next, you'll have the behavioral, uh, behavioral interview, which is basically where the, uh, usually the manager, the hiring manager, the one that you will actually be reporting into, will be asking you questions about yourself, how you manage stakeholders, how you deal with problems. They want to get to know you a little bit better. Can they get along with you? Stuff like that. Um, again, that is a little bit of a, uh, that is out of the scope of this video, but I have another video where I interviewed Nick Singh, who uh, co-authored the book, um, How to Get a Job in Data Science. So great book, affiliate link down in the description below. Next, you have what I call the upper management review or interview, where basically a uh, director or a VP or someone who is in charge of your org might come and interview you. And they just want to make sure that, again, the they're kind of making sure that you fit into their broader grand plan of how they want to do stuff. At a lot of companies, the uh, director kind of sets these grand plans that they want to like have their little org or their little, you know, I kind of, I kind of like to call them fiefdom sometimes. They want their little fiefdom to uh, accomplish. Whereas a manager is very much still an executor. They make sure that the uh, goals of the director are actually met and the people doing the actual executing are usually, you know, uh, what you're interviewing for right now. So this is where you can talk about some of your more ambitious things. Uh, managers don't usually care too much about the more ambitious stuff because they're a lot more in working with the nitty gritty. But uh, this is where the director interview is kind of where you talk about like, oh, I think that we should like push forward uh, machine learning usage in this org or something like that. Then you get an offer, you negotiate your salary, and then you accept your offer. And if you notice, there's a couple of steps over here, right? But the resume only matters for one step, and that is the application and the recruiter scanning your resume. And basically, so, so we have to design our resume to only work in this section, really. Um, and obviously, you do also want the hiring manager to like your resume as well. But this is where most people's resumes drop out. And usually, if you can, at a company that's you know well-functioning, if you can get past the recruiter, then the rest of the interview process is significantly easier. This is the place where you'll see the most failure, most likely, in your application process. So... Now that we've gone over the actual process, let's go ahead and see what we can actually do to get you that kind of a resume. One other thing to remember is that you might also not be paired up with a technical recruiter. Um, large tech companies like the Fang companies, they usually have technical recruiters that are somewhat aware of the actual like terms used in the industry. But uh, I work for a uh, fashion retail company right now where we usually don't use technical recruiters, so the recruiters are not aware of these terms. So make sure that whenever you're using terms inside your resume, like say K nearest neighbors, right? It's a, it's a machine learning algorithm basically. If you're using K nearest neighbors, write K nearest neighbors at one point in your resume and K and in another part of your resume. That way, when they're scanning your resume, they may be looking for K nearest neighbors. They may be looking for K and N. You don't really know how um, much of an expert the recruiter is. They're usually given a sheet by the manager that says, I want you to like look for these stuff in the candidate. And they may or may not know what K and N is. They just know to look for it. Um, but it might also just be called K nearest neighbors. So I would say if you have any acronyms, try to use them twice in your resume and expand on it somewhere in that um, uh, somewhere in your resume. Unless you're talking about something like .NET or something where it's like, okay, like .NET, like people just use .NET, you know. So that is the first section, getting into the mind of the recruiter. So throughout this entire resume writing process, I want you to think, what does a recruiter think? What do they want to see? And how do I make a piece of paper that communicates that I am a like, you know, surefire candidate to um, may, may be an easy yes for this recruiter. So next, let's talk about style. Here's, um, this is something, a section I want to go through relatively quickly. This, these are relatively easy things you can do to make sure your resume isn't difficult for the recruiter to read. So things like um, customizing your resume. I would make sure you customize your resume for every job that you apply to. Don't send in a generic resume to all your jobs. Um, especially if say you're a college student and you're applying to like, you know, maybe 80, 100 jobs uh, coming out of college, make sure that you're customizing your resume per job. Now, this doesn't mean that you write an entirely like 100% custom resume for every job. What this means is that you are, um, you are including bullet points in your resume 
that resonate with what that job is actually looking for. So if you're applying to say Facebook and uh, Macy's, for example, right? With Facebook, if you're gonna be working on a growth team, talk about what you have on your resume, have bullet points that talk about how you know how to look for what users are looking for and grow user counts. If you're applying to Macy's and you're applying for their supply chain team, for example, make sure you include bullet points on how you are a supply chain expert. You're amazing at optimizing things. You know, you know network optimization, you know greenfield analysis that kind of stuff. So when I say customize your resume for every job, it's usually the bullet points underneath your work experience that you really want to customize. Um, and this is really important. And this is something a lot of people don't do. They'll send in generic resumes to every company. And uh, it is a really easy way to get auto, like not auto rejected. It's a really easy way to get rejected quite quickly from a company, because if it's very obvious that you didn't read the job description when you applied, then a recruiter and if not a recruiter, a hiring manager is going to be like, no, this person, like they're just mass applying. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with this right now. So, um, and just as a heads up, so I do work on the other side of the recruiting funnel as well, where I do a lot of, uh, interviews with candidates. And this is something that when I see a resume, I can usually tell if the candidate like didn't customize it at all for the company I work for. File formats, PDFs are the way to go. Um, you can also send in a Word document. I would recommend PDFs because they come out in a, you can see how they look and they will look more or less the same for just about everyone. Uh, even a Word document can look a little bit different depending on if someone's looking at it on a mobile device versus if they're looking at it on their computer. So make sure you use PDFs. File title, use a simple format, customized per company, something like Shashank Kalanithi Nordstrom Resume.pdf. I recommend using underscores. Uh, tech people like seeing underscores instead of spaces and file names, um, especially because a lot of them are from an age where uh, spaces, uh, if you do a lot of coding, you'll know that like, there's, there's a billion different like um, iterations of like white space. And so people just like seeing underscores. This is one of those small tips that can like just show people, okay, hey, this person's like, you know, they're, they're speaking in my language. Um, and you'll see me drop a lot of these kind of small tips in the video. None of these small tips will get you a job. None of these small tips will get you the interview. It's the collection of everything put together that increases your chances of getting the interview. Nothing's deterministic. It's all, it's all probabilistic. Deterministic meaning that if I do this thing, I will get this job. The entire job application process is entirely probabilistic. And the only thing you can do is increase your chances. Length. If you have less than five years of experience, make sure your resume is less than a page long. Unless you're some super mega, like amazing candidate and you've done so much stuff in five years, and usually you'll know if you're this type of person, then uh, your resume should not be more than a page long if you have less than five years of experience. This is a really easy way to lose people's attention because um, if they're hiring for a position that needs less than five years of experience, they don't expect your resume to be more than a page long. Now, if you're hiring for like a manager or directorship, I may wanna see a good history of leadership. I might, I might even see a good history of uh, taking charge of project, products, projects, which might mean, hey, we need to see that this person has a long work history. So if you have less than five years of experience, your resume most likely shouldn't be more than a page long. And remember, like I said, with everything in this video, none of these are like hard rules. If you have a very good reason to make sure your resume, to make your resume longer than one page, then go ahead and do it. You know, see, see, see if it works. Fonts, make sure you use simple fonts, Times New Roman, Calibri, Helvetica. Um, I recommend Times New Roman personally. It looks, it looks professional and it's simple and, um, it is a very easily readable font. So that's why I highly recommend it. Next, make sure nothing, uh, you're not using any light or thin fonts. Uh, remember people have all kinds of different um, uh, visions and they have all different kinds of abilities to like actually see what's on a screen. So if you avoid light and thin fonts then you'll avoid people not being able to read what you're talking about. And one more benefit of Times New Roman is that I's and L's and stuff like that don't get confused in Times New Roman because it's, it's a serif font. And so letters are very easy to distinguish. It's, it's hard to mistake letters inside Times New Roman. Make sure that your, everything you're using is black, um, like your fonts are all black. Um, hyperlinks should be blue in my opinion. That way people know to click on them. So um, your font should be black except for hyperlinks, which should be blue. Uh, and no smaller font size than size 10. Make sure that people with poor eyesight can read your resume. As, especially if you're like talking to a manager, it's possible that like as, you know, I mean, they may be like 50 plus or something or reaching an age where their eyesight is starting to deteriorate or it's more difficult for them to read things. So make sure that your resume is easy to read. Again, remember, this needs to be something that someone can scan and bam, 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 bam. They're like, okay, this candidate has like, you know, like uh, Audrey over here has like everything that we need to have, everything we need to see in order to give her an offer as quickly as possible. 
Pictures and graphics, there should be close to none. You should have no pictures on your resume, most likely. I, I, I guess if you're doing like a computer vision, uh, if you're like applying for a computer vision thing, it might, maybe, maybe a graphic might be um, useful, but there should be close to none. One common thing that I've uh, seen that I uh, definitely don't think is helpful is under skills, people will have like the level of skill they have. So like a four out of five, a three out of five. No, do not do that. Just say you have the skill and they will test that in the technical interview. And the reason I say that is because almost any anyone that's interviewed enough candidates has gotten... Um, I wouldn't say necessarily screwed, but has wasted their time interviewing a candidate who says they know something, but really doesn't the second you give them a tech interview. Um, I've experienced this quite a bit where people say they know R, for example. And I come and, I, and, and in the interview, I give them the interview and they're like, oh, I haven't used it in a while. Well, I'm like, well, then don't write down that you know R. Um, point being, I don't ever take a candidate's um, own admission of their skill level at face value. I need to test them on it because it's so easy for people to write down whatever they, you know, people are really, they will write down whatever they need to, to like get that job. So the skill level thing doesn't really matter. Um, just say you have the skill and then make sure you can back it up with actual performance. Um, again, remember when a recruiter calls you, they may ask you a technical question. Like I was asked, I kept a couple of SQL questions. Um, on the spot when I was interviewing and I basically had to be able to answer them instantly um, in order to move on to the next stage. Uh, and this is just so that everyone saves their time as far as looking for candidates that are actually qualified. And then order of components. So a lot of people, oh, did you say order of components? A lot of people will say your, your education has to be first, things have to be chronological. I don't believe that. I think that the most impressive stuff should be closer to the top and even your job experience doesn't necessarily have to be chronological. Now, that being said, if you did something three years ago, that should not be at the top of your resume. Um, again, I'm not talking about people with like gaps in like their work, uh, in their work history. So I'm talking about like if you have consistent work history, um, something from three years ago should probably not be on top of your resume because I know for sure I don't really remember what I did three years ago. The only reason I remember what I did three years ago is because I read my resume every once in a while to just make sure it stays updated. But I would definitely make sure you play around with the order to make your most uh, impressive achievements closer to the top of your resume. And I'll be talking about this in education versus work experience in a, in, in a second. So what to include? A summary section. So what are the things we want to include in our resume? Summary section, I don't believe that these are effective for tech jobs. Um, I can't say this is true for all jobs. Maybe for if you're like applying for a marketing job, how you write out prose might actually be very important. Again, I don't hire for marketing jobs and I don't know any marketer, so I, I can't necessarily say, um, say yes or no. But I would say for a tech job, a summary section is kind of just a waste of space. Um, unless you really want to communicate a, a certain amount of passion for a subject, maybe like you're working for a gaming company or something, maybe you can use a summary section to be like, I am an avid gamer um, and I play all y'all's games. I know exactly what you guys do. So, um, I would, I would recommend against including a summary section, mostly because remember, people don't read your resume, they scan it. They don't read, they scan. Citizenship status. Okay, so if you have a foreign sounding name like myself, my name is Shashan Kalanithi. It's like 15 characters long, sounds super foreign. Uh, I'm a US citizen, but um, I, I would understand if people didn't think that at first blush, like perfectly understandable. So... If you have a foreign sounding name like mine, um, it might be helpful. I'm not saying do this or not, but it might be helpful to include in the upper right corner of your resume, U.S. citizen, um, only because, so I've been on the other side of the ATS system, so applicant tracking system, uh, which is basically kind of like workday or stuff. It's, it's the thing you submit your resume to and then it like organizes everything for all candidates. Um, you will sometimes find, if you're on the other side of an ATS, you will sometimes find um, people who need sponsorship will sometimes say they don't need sponsorship, but then you'll be like, well, their entire education history is in a foreign country and and, and they finished their degree like, like three months ago. Uh, do they really not need sponsorship? So that's why I would recommend if you have a foreign sounding name like mine, it might be beneficial for you to have US citizen in the upper right corner. That being said, large publicly traded companies um, that work in non-sensitive work like Nordstrom, Google, Facebook, Walmart, um, Dell. I know Google and Facebook probably do some sensitive work, but a lot of the work they do is also non-sensitive. So large publicly traded companies working in non-sensitive work will most likely not care if they need to sponsor you. Sponsoring Sponsorship, I've heard, costs about $20,000. Like the whole process is about $20,000 per candidate. Um, but these companies are just looking for great talent. They don't care if they need to sponsor you because that is, um, at the end of the day, especially in the tech world, there just isn't enough talent in the U.S. to you know fill in all jobs. That being said, I've worked for smaller private companies where they didn't want to sponsor. And they wrote that clearly in the job description. They said, we, we don't want to sponsor. 
Um, and in, if you're applying for that type of a job and you don't need sponsorship, you're a permanent citizen, uh, a permanent resident, you're a U.S. citizen, um, then it might be beneficial for you to write U.S. citizen in the upper right-hand corner of the resume. Um, I've never done that personally, but I've seen people who do that, and the logic of it makes sense to me. So that's just something to remember if you're applying for a smaller company, maybe. GPA. Okay. People say, colleges will say, you have to include this. Uh, you do not have to include it. Unless the company says, we want your GPA on the resume, don't include it unless you have an excellent GPA. Uh, again, remember, your only thing is you, you want to only present the best parts about yourself. So for example, someone like me, I had a horrendous GPA leaving college and having a GPA on my, my resume would literally never help me. There, there's no way a company would look at my GPA and be like, oh yes, this is a great candidate. Th this is something that helped me hire this candidate. So do not include GPAs if you don't have an excellent GPA. What you consider an excellent GPA, I'll let you figure that out. Um, only because I'll be 100% hundred honest, I don't really know because I don't, uh, I, I've had uh, candidates with their, I ignore their GPA whenever I see it on their resume. I really don't care um, because what you do in school is so far removed from what you do in the workplace that I don't think a GPA is a, at all a good measure of how skilled a candidate is. Um, well, I, I don't think, I, I think it can talk about, okay, this candidate is like determined, but even like, see, you, you can get a good GPA by just grinding hard and kind of just like studying, studying, studying. But a lot of the times for the jobs that we're hiring for, we're looking for someone that can like think out of the box, think creatively and stuff like that. And a good GPA doesn't necessarily communicate that. So I would say, uh, as far as GPA is concerned, um, only if you have a high GPA include it. otherwise don't. And after your first or second job, I would just drop it all together. Um, people don't care about your education after your first job, unless you, again, if you went to like Harvard or something, then you know that might carry you for a couple of years. But um, if you went to any other university, I wouldn't say it really matters. College clubs, if you need to pad out your resume before your first job, um, this is a great way to do it. Talk about the different clubs you're in. What, you, what, what a lot of people like to say, right, is a lot of people like to use this to talk about their leadership skills. But if you're that inexperienced of a candidate, as in you're just, you know, you're just starting your career, um, as an entry-level candidate, excuse me, as an entry-level candidate, you're most likely not going to be leading anyone. So focus instead on crafting your bullet points to prove that you're a go-getter and a quick learner. Don't talk about how you're a leader because no one hired out of an entry-level position um, with a bachelor's or like a non-MBA master's is immediately being made a manager. Um, that being said, if you are being, if you are in that situation, then maybe talk about like your leadership and stuff. But even then, I'm more interested in your professional experience. So um, a lot of people will use it to talk about their leadership skills because that's what you're taught to do in school. You're taught to like be a leader, talk about your leadership skills. But an entry level candidate, like I'm not making them lead anything. Why would I make them lead anything? You know, they 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 are just leaving college. They have no experience. So um, I would say focus on how you're a go getter. So say you were a president in a club, obviously mention that. You know, it's a good thing. Obviously mention that. But really talk about how, for example, you pushed to have like this project that wasn't that people last year couldn't do. You pushed to make sure that that could be done this year. Something like that. Academic writings. Um, so I get questions about this stuff a lot. If you're a master's student or, you know, some bachelor's students or a PhD student, academic writings are a great way to really flex your research muscles, especially if you're joining a company as an applied scientist. So I moved into a new building um, and Amazon headquarters is right over there. So half the building is just Amazon people. And I was talking to an applied scientist the other day at the coffee shop in the bottom floor of the building. Um, Guy's a PhD and you know, th those types of positions, flexing your research muscles is a great way to get these applied research jobs, or sorry, applied science jobs in major tech corporations. So I think that's a, th that's a great place to really flex your knowledge over there. Try and relate, uh, try and relate your academic research to the company if at all possible. And if not, if like, so for example, say you did research in to makeup and you're gonna be applying um, for Amazon's like, I don't know, supply chain division as an applied scientist really talk instead of talking about the makeup part of your work really talk about how you know the research process and you can get down and dirty with research and really forge new solutions using your research muscles you know um so with academic writings focus on the topics of your academics if it's directly related to what you're applying for otherwise focus on the skills that your academic uh writings helped you develop otherwise. 
email addresses. Make sure to include this and try to have one that's simple with your name in it. So, uh, well, I'm not going to share what mine is, but mine, mine does have my name in it. Avoid yahoo.com and aol.com as there's a weird bias against this in Silicon Valley. So this comes from that book I read by Nick Singh where he talks about how Silicon Valley people have this weird bias against yahoo.com emails. Um, and so try and use a Gmail if you can. Gmail is kind of the, kind of the king over there. So, um, I would recommend using a Gmail if you can. Again, remember, this tip will not get you a job, but the collection of all these things put together, that's what helps you out. Phone number. So we have a scam phone ep- a scam phone call epidemic going on in the US right now, and I wouldn't recommend putting your phone number on your resume. Recruiters will reach out to your email anyways to schedule a call, and in that email, you can share your phone number because your resume, your, your resume is kind of a public thing, honestly. Um, you may not share it with everyone in the world, but they're, I mean, you know, it. it uh, it is not unreasonable to expect your resume to just find its way to, you know, on the internet randomly. And because of that, I would avoid putting my phone number on my resume just to prevent your phone number from being leaked all over the internet. If a recruiter needs to call you, they will uh, email you prior to schedule the call, um, or at least any reputable recruiter will do that. Um, or if you're on the job application portal, a lot of these application portals ask you to put in your phone number, and that's a more secure location to put in your phone number. Location, unless you are local to the company or willing to move there, move to the company's location on your own dime or on your own money, there's little benefit to putting your location. This is why I recommend leaving it off. So for example, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I wanted a job in Silicon Valley or uh, basically the West Coast. So like Silicon Valley or Seattle, I wanted a job there, right? So what I would do, and I wanted it so badly that I was willing to move there on my own dime. Now, again, that being said, any reputable company will pay to have you relocate, um, at least at a certain experience level. And, or I can't say any reputable company, but large publicly traded companies who want good talent will pay to have you relocated. But what I did is on my resume, I just put in Seattle or I just put in San Francisco. Um, and I dealt with the consequences later. If the recruiter was like, wait, you said you were in San Francisco. Uh, and I'm like, I honestly just wanted to get my resume in. Um, I'm willing to move there on my own dime. And again, a, a reputable company, if they have a move in package, won't just take it away because you said you're willing to move there on your own dime again. Um, com- the, the uh, interview process is a bit of a two-sided street. The company also wants to have a good reputation as a company that's worth interviewing for. They don't want to. They don't want to give you a hard time in the interview just to give you a hard time, and then like be known as a company that like, oh, I don't want to interview at like X Y Z company because like their interview process is miserable, you know. So, I would say unless you're local to where the company is or are willing to move there on your own money, um, there is little benefit to putting in your location. So I wouldn't do it if I were you personally. Jobs prior to college. So, you know, I used to work at Taco Bell and J. Crew as a, you know, a cashier and a sales rep, respectively, prior to college. Do not include these unless it's somehow very related to the job you're uh, applying for. The jobs you had prior to college have close to no bearing um, on what you're doing uh, going into like, like these uh, more professional jobs. Again, unless it's super related. So a great example would be, say you were a mechanic prior to going to college, right? Or you, you know, you, you would do something with cars basically prior to going to college. That is something that actually might be interesting to a automobile company. So um, that is a situation which I would recommend. Okay, yeah, no, put, put that in there, put that in there, you know, show your interest. Project portfolio, link this near the top of your resume with your contact information. Make sure to use a short link and a hyperlink. So basically what what happens is a lot of the times uh, people will get your resume in like a paper format or something. And you need to make sure that they need to type in just like 10 characters to get to your webpage. Don't put in some huge URL that they have to type in um, and hyperlink it for sure on your PDF. Skills, if you're going to include a skill, oh, sorry. If you're going to include a skill section, keep it short and sweet. Your work experience and interview will speak more to your skills than this section will. If you're going to have a skill section, make it as compact as you can because you are you only for most people, again, if you have less than five years of experience, you only have so much space in order to actually show that you are the right candidate. Don't waste it listing out a billion different skills that you could potentially have. And then certifications. Certifications, especially those deeply tied to the work you do, can be a great addition to your resume. Unless your job revolves around certifications, certain cybersecurity jobs are like this, for example, try and keep this section down to a minimum. So I have a couple of certifications and I have them all in one line. Um, I have Lean Six Sigma, Alteryx, and Google's TensorFlow certification. I just keep them all in one line. 
um, because it is an accomplishment. Like it did take work to get that certification. Like these are all certifications directly from the company that um, gives them uh, in the form of like the Google TensorFlow certification. TensorFlow is a Google product and I got a Google certification for it. Uh, Altrix, I got the certification from Altrix, the company for their product. And um, Lean Six Sigma, I got it from a certified organization. Um, to be uh, green belt certified, you need to get it from an, or an organization that like gives out these certifications uh, and they need to be certified themselves. So these certifications did, did take work to get and I would recommend putting them all, but I would recommend putting them all in one line. So I still have them even though like, honestly, I will say no companies, uh, no interviewers ever asked me about them, but I still have them because like they did take work to obtain and at least the Google TensorFlow one I feel is relevant to the work I do. All right, so now we've gone over a lot of information. We've talked about a lot of aspects of the resume. Now let's talk about your work experience. And I promise I'll show you guys a, an example resume at the end of the video. That way we can bring all of this together in one like, like compact, easy to follow section. So the perfect bullet point, this is, this is key. And any friends that ask me to review the resumes, I talk about this section a lot. Under your work experience, you're going to have various bullet points and you want to craft the perfect bullet point. Um, so you'll have like, you know, I worked at Interstate Batteries. What did I do? I have three bullet points there. Each of those bullet points, this is where you are going to um, kind of like a blacksmith forging, you know, a knife or something. I don't, I don't know anything about blacksmithing. Um, you will be forging and forging and forging and worrying about every single little word over here because this is where a lot of recruiters immediately skip to on your resume. They want to say, okay, is what this person doing relevant to what I'm hiring for? So uh, a great example of this is um, Amazon reaches out to me fairly consistently uh, for supply chain positions. I'm personally not inter interested in supply chain positions, but early in my career, I had a very heavy focus on supply chain. So because of that, you know, I keep getting contacted by Amazon, which is a company that needs a bunch of supply chain experts uh, for supply chain jobs. I'm personally not very interested, but uh, in, in supply chain jobs. Um, but this kind of tells you how like my resume, because of like the way my bullet points are crafted, really angles me towards supply chain stuff. If people like looked at what I do now, they'd be like, oh no, this guy's more of a data analyst or like, like a data science type of guy. But again, people look at these bullet points immediately. So I would uh, recommend spending a lot of time on this. So under each of your work experiences, you'll have a couple of bullet points detailing the work you did. You need to craft these bullet points to maximize their impact as this is the meat of your resume. Try and format your bullet points to outline the effect of what you did first. And if you can quantify that effect and it's substantial, even better. If it has a dollar amount associated with it, even better. Um, again, remember at the end of the day, a corporation's job is to make a, um, I, I can't curse in my videos, is to make a lot of money, you know? Uh, and because of that, if you can tie the work you do directly to either saving money or making money, that's a winner right there. Below is a format I like to follow with as many bullet points in my resume as possible. You, you can't do this for every bullet point, but you can do this for a lot of bullet points. Um, and I bring this up because a lot of people craft their bullet points, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of people craft their bullet points in the exact opposite way. You want to talk about the effect of what you've done, what was the cause of it, and then any supporting information after that. This is the key. So here's an example. Say you automated a process that saved the company about $10,000 a month using a tool called Alteryx. Um, you can word this bullet point, collectively saved 20 plus hours per week and $35,000 monthly of manual labor for management level employees by using Alteryx and Tableau to automate workflows to deliver decision-making insights consistently and accurately. Um, so this actually needs to say 35,000. Now you might think this is a bit contrived. Um, if you haven't guessed, this is a, a bullet point straight from my resume. So notice how we start off with the effect. Saved 20 plus hours and 35K monthly. Let me go ahead and italicize this because I mean, let's bold it, you know, let's be bold here. Oh, whoops. What a lot of technical people would have done is they would have said, used all tricks in Tableau to save time through, by automating a process. They would have said something along those lines. That doesn't have impact. $35,000 monthly has an impact. Now they're like, okay, I can visualize. Uh, another thing that an interview is, and an interview is all of, like the best interviews are where they're a conversation and it's where the recruiter and the leadership that's hiring you can see, oh, okay, Andrea slots perfectly into this spot in my team and she can do this thing on my team excellently. She's going to make my life, our lives way easier. And that's where these numbers are very helpful. Oh, Andrea, 
can save us a lot of money, uh, a lot of money monthly. Like they know how to automate processes to like save money. So start off with the effect, then the cause, and any supporting information after that. Um, I would actually say you could probably even shorten this a little bit. This is from an old resume. I would say this could probably be shortened quite a bit. But also notice how I put Alteryx and Tableau in there. Now I know if they're looking for someone that knows BI stuff, if they're looking for someone that knows Tableau, if they're looking for someone that knows Alteryx, well, I have that information here immediately, easy to see. So calculating effect, you might be wondering, how did I get to this $35,000 number? And this is a question I get from a lot of people because a lot of technical jobs, you're not directly involved with like numbers. So for example, I know people that work in procurement uh, and in procurement, um, these are people that basically negotiate contracts with companies to make sure that the company procures software products or whatever they need to at a reasonable rate. And they make sure the contracts are um, don't leave the company with a lot of liability and a lot of problems in the future. Um, with these types of jobs, it's fairly easy to calculate ROI on the work that you've done, at least at the very surface level, because you will say, I saved a million dollars on this contract. You know, like there's a number associated with that. And people like, it is a metric people use to track themselves, honestly. With tech jobs, that can be a little bit more difficult for a lot of tech jobs because you're, you're designing something, you're creating something. Uh, but you're usually creating a part of something. Again, these things are so complex that you're rarely the software engineer that creates an entire product on their own. So you need to talk about, we need to find some way to quantify the work that you do. This is where I say the onus is on you to find some creative way to do that. But one technique that I've used and I want to share with you guys is uh, how I calculated rev how I calculated value with this bullet point that I created over here. So the $35,000 number came because we knew that the process that we created, right, had saved a management employee one full week's worth of work per month. Basically, they were running this manual process. It took them an entire week, um, like the entire 40 hours of a week to run this process once a month. So that means it's about a quarter of their working time. You know, like uh, every month has about four weeks net. And this is about a quarter of their working time. Really, it's more than that because of PTO. So we estimated that the manager made somewhere in the ballpark, ballpark of about 120K per year. So taking a quarter of that time and adding a little bit of extra for the efficiencies garnered by automated processes, making fewer mistakes, we came up with the, the, with the value of at least $35,000 to the company um, in time saved for that employee. And this is an example of what I would call solid logic to explain your ROI on the work that you've done. So don't try and be very convoluted with your logic. It's very simple to follow. I say the employee made about 120K per year. I saved a quarter of their time. 30 to 30 to 40 K right there. You know, um, this is very easy logic. It can be explained in one sentence and that's one way to quantify the work that you do. So as you can see, calculating effect is an imperfect science, but as long as the logic you have to calculate your effect makes sense and is consistent, then you can use techniques like this to estimate the monetary value of your projects. I think monetary has an E inside it. Now let's go through an example resume. This is an example resume by my friend Nick Singh, who co-authored the book, uh, Ace the Data Science Interview, 201 Real Questions Asked, affiliate link in the description below. I really liked it. Um, and we, I have an interview, which I also have linked in the description below, where we talk about the whole interviewing, pro we talk about the whole application process. Um, and it covers tips and tricks to AC uh, analytics interview process. Um, it, it's definitely more focused on analytics stuff than on um, other tech jobs. So just th th a little bit of a heads up over there. Um, but you'll see over here, we got Nick Nippon Singh. Um, he has his email over there. Uh, and then you see right there, portfolio immediately at the top, no phone number over here. And then you have your uh, portfolio link over there. Again, github.com slash Nippon Singh, easy, easy to get to. Experience, so you'll see, so this is actually his resume right out of college. And a lot of colleges will say, make sure you put your college on top. Again, colleges have an, in they have a vested interest in making themselves seem more important than they actually are. Um, no, he went to Virginia Tech, I believe, no, Virginia, he went to some Virginia university, but he interned at Uber. So here's an example. If you were, if you went to college at UTD, but you interned at Uber for a summer, your internship at Uber is way more impressive than you going to UTD. Again, UTD is a great college, but Uber is way more impressive and companies care about that a lot more. So go ahead and put in whatever order makes sense, whatever your most impressive accomplishments are. So you can see over here, he put experience at the top and education's all the way down here. It's like the third thing there. Projects came after that. And that's good. At the end of the day, the company, again, they don't, care what, again, unless you went to Harvard or something, they don't care what university you came from, you know, Harvard, Stanford, you came from like, or like Georgia Tech or something like these like major tech universities where it's like, okay, yeah, that, that's an engineering expert right there. Uh, they don't care what university you came from. They just want to know that you have the degree because I don't know, we all agreed that people need degrees for some reason. Experience is what's most important um, for most people. Most people, their experience will be more impressive than their college. Again, unless you went to an elite university, um, 
I would say your experience is probably more impressive than your uh, education. And you can see he bolded a key sections over here. Again, remember, you need to make this resume scannable. Immediately reduce latency from 45 seconds to 80 milliseconds. He has quantified what he has done, and I can, I can, I see it. I see it right there. Um, 45 seconds to 80 milliseconds, that's a pretty big deal. So, and it's bolded. So, it, like, I was immediately drawn to that. I actually read this before I read this Google thing over here. So, stuff that's really impressive, go ahead and bold it. Experiment. Do what you need to do to draw people's eyes to the best parts of your resume. I want to keep this video a little bit open ended because I really want to encourage you, I want to give you the tools in order to make your own future, in order to craft your own way of getting into this field. I don't want to like spoon feed you everything because you will find when, when you are spoon fed things, you will very quickly run into roadblocks where like if you meet, if you run into a situation that's slightly different than what you're used to, immediately nothing makes sense anymore. So that's why I'm kind of giving these like overarching tips. But if you're interested in checking out this, uh, this resume, go ahead and check the description below. I, it's, it's linked in this notion page that I'm going to have linked in the description below, but thank you guys so much for joining me today. Uh, again, if you want to support the work, make sure you like, and subscribe, please. The YouTube algorithm loves likes. Subscriptions are great too. And if you really love the work that we have over here, be sure to join the Patreon or the YouTube membership. It gives you benefits like access to the Discord group, direct contact with me. And um, there are a couple of videos I have like hands-on machine learning, like there's a textbook I go over and practical statistics for data scientists where I actually have all my notes in the um, accessible to the YouTube and members and Patreon patrons. So thank you guys so much for your time and I hope you have a great day.